Hi, and uh, welcome to our the second part of our less organising lessons from our history. Um, Roger McKenzie was going to be here and hosting this session. Unfortunately, he's having connection difficulties. So um, we want to thank Bob Kelly, uh, Unison Northwest's Education Officer, and Professor Mary Davis here for the second part of, uh, of this organising lessons from our history. If you want to catch up on the first one, it's available on Unison Organising's uh, Facebook page and also on the Unison National uh, YouTube channel. Um, and without further ado, thank you for uh, coming, both of you, and uh, over to you, Bob. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, <clears throat> all the fun of doing stuff virtually. There's always there's always a technical hit somewhere, um, so we'll just <laughs> carry on. Um, so, so Mary. Um, you were going to discuss people that were sort of hidden from history or not normally found in history books, I think. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, it's, it's really, um, it's a phrase that Sheila Rowbottom used, first of all, hidden from history. And it makes you think about what actually has been hidden. It's not just people, but it's also our history, um, which has been... Um, just not told, not 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 for workers anyway. And even um, as an academic discipline, labour history has disappeared. It's as though um, historians think that the working class doesn't exist anymore. Therefore, you don't have to write about them. And and there is that that element of it. You know, the whole it's really started I mean, with the whole you never had it so good. And then of course Thatcher wanted to erase workers from his well, not erase workers actually, and certainly erase trade unions. And I think that's been, that's figured really now in um, academic um, circles. Labour history, you'd be very, very hard pressed to find anywhere that teaches labour history as such. They teach industrial relations or human resource management or all of these things, but not. So I think labour history has actually been hidden. And even when it wasn't, it was written by academics for academics. And it was never written by workers for workers, or at least with a, a working class and trade union uh, audience in mind. So that element has been has been hidden from history, I think, and, and increasingly so. And unless workers themselves reclaim it, we're, we're actually um, doing project at the moment, which um, is commemorate what well, commemorate marking the centenary of the TNG, which and the TNG was um, in a way it's some sort of a parallel labour movement, or it was the labour movement actually for a while, in a sense that, you know, the Labour Party had its headquarters at Transport House and, you know, Devon and people like that were key people in, in various Labour governments, or oh, not that many Labour governments. So that when that's an active involve attempting to actively involve workers in writing their history, because they do write bits for it, and they also it's a huge old history project. But the people who are hidden from history are, are, are largely black workers and women workers. And their history has been written. People discover this or that person. But there's a, a, a discipline called women's history and there's a discipline called race or, or black history. My issue is how is this integrated into what we know about the history of the labor movement? Because that those two groups of people were absolutely integrally essential to the labour movement, completely ignored, of course, for years. But actually, that's really what needs to be understood. Why was the history of the labour movement written as though trade unions and the labour movement were all white males only? And the, in leadership terms, they were, but not in activism terms. So that's why the hidden from history, for me, at any rate, encompasses those groups who were, who were left out, sanitised and left out, with a, with a failure to understand the ideology that ensured that they were left out, namely sexism and racism, which permeated everything, but also the subject itself. I'm sorry to have gone on so long, but you asked the question. No, no, yeah. I, no. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think it's one um, one of the things that you often find is it's it's very difficult to find uh, labour history written actually from the point of view of the people who are actually involved in it. I mean, I mean that's not to say, by the way, we you know the we some academics like yourself, who you know who write, <laughs> um, 
who write history and try and write it from the, the point of view of the you know uh, the working class and etc. Um, and there is actually some great examples of it. I mean, we had a sort of spate in the in the nineteen sixties, didn't we? Um, mm. With um, I mean, I think I think the catalyst was E. P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working yeah. Class. Yeah. Which is a wonderful book, by the way, and I'd recommend it to anybody. I think it's one of my favourite history books of all time. Um, but then there was the, um, the history workshop with yes. Raphael Samuel at yes. Ruskin College, yeah, yeah. Uh, where you know Raph encouraged working class people to actually do to write their own um, mm. history. Uh, so we had the spate of it, but, but like you say, the, what's his name uh, with the. <clears throat> Uh, the rise of uh, Thatcherism and the Conservative governments in the in the nineteen eighties, and that's been pushed to the side, I think. Uh, and of course, things like uh, doing history workshop and stuff, um, whether or not institutions have got the funding to actually do this these days, you know, because of the, the cuts and stuff. So it's interesting. So I think you're right. Um, I mean, I've one of the things I was going to look, talk about today was, uh, first of all, which sort of links into what you were talking about, was one of the things, last time I think we talked a lot about, we talked about disputes and strikes. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about labour history, we always seem to concentrate on those things. Mm -hmm. But actually, from trade union point of view, they're not the things that, that, that that's not the thing that we were involved in the most. Mm -hmm. We're actually involved in, you know, day-to-day -day activities about, you know, defending our rights or trying to better ourselves in the workplace, and a lot of a lot of I don't think there's a lot of history about that. So one of the things I was thinking about is um, so how do we find um, about what other you know what people were doing, what trade unions were doing in the past in that respect, mm -hmm. um, and I was hoping that Roger was going to be here because I was going to I, I had a little route round in me um, my library. Um, the other day, I was actually looking for something else, and like you, that happens, you find other stuff, don't you? Um, and I was, I was, I found a load of um, journals of the Sheet Metal Workers Union from the 1930s, which I, I, I used to be a sheet metal worker, by the way. Um, when some people said I had a real job, is um, <laughs> um, so I watched them. So I, 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 these are things that I found. When I was a when I was a sheet metal worker, I found in our union cupboard, uh, and I kept them. Otherwise, someone had thrown them out. Um, and, and that's a thing, by the way. One of the things about you know when people are uh, throwing things out of their union offices and whatever, uh, have a think about maybe that these these things that you've got, these artifacts, these books or pamphlets or whatever that you've got, actually in thirty years in years time, someone might actually might want to look at that from an historical point of view, you know. Um, so that's the, the way I look. And I, I, I found a couple of examples that I was going to show Roger because I know Roger has uh, talked a lot about um, automation and how this effect that it's going to have on uh, on workers. Um, and it's interesting that, of course, uh, new technology is a, a recurring theme within, I think, the, the, the workplace. And it's a, the, it's a thing that trade unions... I've had to battle against over the years, right from, you know, the, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution with the Luddites, etc. So I found a couple of examples of it. Um, in this, there was first of all in this um, the Sheet Metal Workers and Braziers Quarterly Journal from 1937. And although I have to, you have to apologise for the, um, have we lost Mary? Yeah. Okay. Oh, they're still there. All right. <laughs> We've got. I mean, it's here. What's his name? I apologise for the, the language, but it was the 1930s, yeah, and it was a, quite a very male-dominated union. Um. So what's his name? So they said, you know, they're talking about men and machines, and they're saying, you know, machines now run the world, etc. And they're saying, you know, machines ought to produce leisure, but all it actually produces. Um, is translated into unemployment um, and they're saying you know the march of scientific invention cannot be stopped but it can be controlled not by one person not by a score but by the organized efforts of workers generally 
So this is a campaign that they're doing in the 1930s, 1937 against the rise of new technology, which would have been having a big effect on, on skilled craftsmen like sheet metal workers at the time. So that idea of um, uh, that this uh, threat of automation is a new thing to work. It's, it's, it's not. It's something that we've dealt with in the past, and I, and I think the way unions have dealt with it in the past, we can learn from. Yeah, and I've got another example as well. From, um, I found a TUC activities book. Or this from 1984. Yeah, I'm a bit sad like that. I keep all the old. Uh, materials that we've used over the years and one of the the activities in it this is one of the activities in it is and i'll find it now is introducing computers no yes yes i remember <laughs> yeah. so, this is this is an activity about um having to deal with um actually computers being brought into the workplace yeah and actually, if you think about it, the effect that the computers have had, must have had on the number of jobs, um, you know, uh, at the time, it must have been incredible. I was actually reading about um, a dispute the other week. Um, it was a, a typist dispute in Liverpool. Um, and there was 300 women employed as typists in Liverpool City Council in the early 1980s. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just imagine how many of those jobs have now been lost because of just the introduction of computers. Um, so yes, that's just to show that what's the name that these things come round, these themes and stuff. You know, did you want yeah, to say yeah. anything? Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take you up on, on, on a number of things. One is the E. P. Thompson book, which you said was the best best book ever. I mean, it's a fantastic book. Well, I didn't say it was the best book ever. Yeah, well, it's a good. But anyway, anyway, all labour historians have achieved on it. However, um, it's called The Making of the English Working Class. And actually, um, I think it was when I became a professor, did my uh, professor, I don't want to say, blah, blah, but on, on that, because I wanted to look at the making of the other half of the English working class, yeah. namely women, which really only occupies about five pages in that book. And if yeah. you look at the early um, Industrial Revolution at you know, end of 18th, beginning of the 19th century, women were the first factory workers. They were the first that were, went into the mills. And it's not mentioned. It's mentioned by, by um, yeah, true. Uh, um, uh, local records at the time, factory inspectors, all, and so Engels also talks about the preponderance of women workers. So Thompson's wonderful, but he fits into a um, a category of what I call the mainly manly Marxist greats, who were fantastic in the sense that they were interested in labour history, but they were absolutely gender blind and colour blind. Now you could say that's just a modern thing, and I shouldn't criticise them for that. And and I don't criticise their work. I criticise for what's left out of it. And then on the, this, this raises another question of records, what you've just mentioned, and you've, you've looked yeah. at the sheet metal box. It, it's a, a dreadful, dreadful thing that we don't guard our own history. And I, I know, for example, um, the, there was a union, the, the records of so many trade unions are just either put on skips or they're, they're just yeah. ignored altogether. Um, I mean, for example, there was a women's union which which um, amalgamated with the GMB. All those records have yeah. gone, um, absolutely yeah. disappeared. The, Mary the, McCarthy, the, yeah. This, this yeah. Uh, webinar to appeal to people, don't hide stuff under your bed. Don't hide, as I, I know for a fact that some that, that does happen if you're involved in a local dispute. The one repository for all of this is the Modern Record Centre. They will take all of this stuff. And uh, not so much the TUC Library, but the Modern Record Centre is the place, that's where I, what I'm using at the moment for all the old TNG records. But there is a big issue that arises from this that I don't know if you've thought about, but I, it's on my mind all the time. We're looking at paper records. This is the thing about technology. What happens now when somebody wants to write the history of our movement in 50 years' time? It's all on computers. It's all on hard drives. Yeah. How do we access that? I mean, it's something that really, really, really bothers me um, because 
I mean, there's, going to archives these days means going through paper or, or, or it's sometimes on microfilm or, or sometimes being digitized, but they're paper records. Um, and we, have, we won't have them now. We won't have them at all. So somewhere in the sky, somebody's got to really re make a repository of all this stuff. Um, I know that with this big project that we're doing at the moment, which actually turns out to be the biggest oral history project in the country, and it's, it's shop stewards that are doing the interviewing, all of this is going to be on a dedicated server, which will be accessible. It will be public. But, you know, there's an issue about that. And just the final point you raised about technology, absolutely, I'm glad you raised that because that is um, actually partly what I've just said is all about technology. How do we access our past now when we haven't got the records or their only and people can raise hard drives as well, which is a problem. But um, the technology thing, you're dead right. I mean, in a way, there's been several iterations of this. One was of the early industrialization. It's all about harnessing new sources of motive power. First it was steam, then it was gas, then it was electricity, and now it's the microchip. And you're right, every at every stage of and I mean the real big big issue for us now is not so much it's artificial intelligence and how how our movement copes with that. Um, and it, I mean that obviously that's a subject for another discussion and, and people who are but but it is it is an issue but it's not you're right to say that we've got to put that in historical context because workers have been faced with this by the way Luddites weren't machine record records they were using their in a protest against being put out of work they were using the machines which weren't their own um, to uh, um, as a protest, as a form of protest, it wasn't they were anti machines, they were using machines. Yeah, well, not, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you know that, but I just, just for the benefit of people. No, no, I think, I think you're right. I think I, I actually, I, I actually hate it when people say, Oh, you're a Luddite. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I actually, I actually, I probably bore people because I actually try and put them right on it. Yeah. Um, you I'm, know, I'm sure you uh, know, but I'm glad that we need to say, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, I think you're right. Which, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't that they were against the new technology, but it, it was a, an issue about them, uh, not just uh, about uh, their working conditions and their losing jobs, but it was also about being forced into factories exactly. because they had they were like sort of self-employed, uh, exactly. you know, uh, and they had some control over the the work that they did. And yeah. their big concern was that they were going to lose that control. By being forced to go into factories, exactly. it's actually a lot more complicated uh, than people think. Uh, that whole thing, but that's 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 why we need to study these things properly, don't we? And look at look at it from the point of view of the actual people that were involved in it. Yeah, you see, that's what Thompson did, didn't he? He wanted yeah. to rescue the poor stocking of the handloom weaver, and actually, yeah. what. what that whole making of the working class, I think that's quite an issue, I think, throughout this whole all the technological ch technological changes that we're seeing. How do we define a worker? What is working what is what is it to be working class? And I think we have to come back time and again to the Marxist definition. If you sell your labour power for a wage, whether you like it or not, you are a worker. Now you might think that oh, your status is higher because you don't get your hands dirty or you might even be in middle management, that if you're forced to sell your labour power for a wage, that to me is the definition of a worker. So all of this change in technology um, creates um, it cre creates a dif a different forms of work. I mean, the composition of the working class changes, but its essence doesn't. And I think that's the thing that, that really labour history should be should be much much more uh, aware of i mean people write histories of the, uh, of the labor movement or of, of the working class movement but they don't really understand what well i just the, the very the change in the composition of the working class and that, i think that's what's happened now why people don't like labor history anymore because they think oh well we're all nobody works in factories nobody's a proletarian i.e they directly produce surplus value um so people don't think workers exist, but they do. And, and this pandemic yeah. shows, doesn't it? You know, who are the frontline workers? They are those people there who are still selling their labour power from, well, we all are actually, aren't we? Including you. Yeah. Including, including you. me. 
including yeah. me, yeah. Was, um, no, I think I think you're right, Mary, and I think uh, we that it's it's that whole getting back to we need to get that back to finding ways of getting working people to write their own history and get involved in that in some ways. Um, and maybe that's something that what's now uh, we need to be looking at in unions itself. And I'm, and I'm you know, it'd be, I'm really looking forward to the, the, the TNG project um, uh, that that's you're doing. Yeah. yeah, I think I think actually it'd be wonderful if other unions could do it. I could see, you know, <clears throat> looking at um, local government and really that is something, well, basically the public sector. Um, I mean, I, I'm writing stuff now about the um, 1979 winter of discontent. This is for volume five. Um, but of course, you know, Newpy and uh, with, well, predecessors of, of Unison were really so centrally involved. And it's a, it's, a, it's a part of our history that's been so willfully misinterpreted. Actually, yeah. that title, The Winter of Discontent, you know, it was coined by the Daily, I think it was Daily Mail, you know, it was a, a journalist. So we're, we're encouraged to see this not as a big struggle, you know, of workers uh, for, you know, decent wages, but, you know, horrible strike prone, you know, the unions have taken over the country. And of course, that's what led to such a, in fact, I think the movement swallowed this, in a sense, because the fight back against all the anti-union laws was a bit pathetic, wasn't it? I mean, led, led by the TUC, didn't really need it. Um, massive unemployment. And then, you know, the, we've got the worst, uh, well, we all know that, um, but the worst trade union legislation anywhere. People go on about, you know, oh, you know, unions in this, yeah. that, uh, in Hong Kong or China or wherever. But I mean, record of this country is just it is just dreadful very very difficult well you know that you're a union organizer how difficult it is um deliberately and the lesson i think that the you see the, the tories and the ruling class do learn lessons from their history the lesson that was learned really was from 1971 when Heath uh, introduced uh, his industrial relations act one fell swoop tried to do anything Thatcher and the Tories learned from that. Twelve yeah. pieces of legislation then replaced yeah. that that big omnibus thing. And Heath was defeated, and the movement defeated him. But we haven't defeated this. And we've seen, you know, what, what we see is peach and troughs in Labour history, don't we? And because we're in a yeah. trough now, people think the movement's finished. But there's been troughs before. I mean, real low points. We're in one. Uh, uh, um, well, yeah. in fact, I think we might be coming out of one if we look at patterns. Yeah. You know, union membership actually for the first time during, is going going up during the pandemic, isn't it? And that's one of the things that I, I learned from history is never write the movement off because it's had terrible low points before. Terrible, you know. For example, you know, um, during the period of, of uh, well, what's called new model unionism, which left out women, left out semi-skilled and unskilled workers. They thought they reached a high point because they, they, you know, they got the government on the on their side in a way. The TUC was formed. It was a pressure group. They got some positive trade union legislation, but actually, in a way, it was at a low point. You know, um, ideologically, it was a, a low point. Um, but then it, it, you know, things things progressed and more organisation took place. And I, I always think about that period from the 1880s when unions spread amongst semi-skilled and unskilled workers. And you look at some, some like the great dock strike. Again, the, it, it, we could learn from that history. This was zero hours contracts. This was the, organising in the worst possible conditions. Now, people say now, oh, it's terrible. Zero hours contracts. Yeah. We've got stable workplaces. Well, the docks in the 1880s were exactly like that. And yet, somebody like Tom Mann and, and others and Eleanor Marx um, did organise amongst them. And it, was, it proved that it was possible. We should learn from that, shouldn't we? Don't you think? That's what yeah, we were talking I mean, about. I, I, I'm, I'm totally agreeing. It amazes me when I look back at uh, that period and how people organised and stuff. Um, and when we, I mean, we, you know, the... So the, the lesson that we can learn, which people talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, peripheral workers or 
the yeah. gig economy yeah. today or whatever. Yeah. But they forget in actual fact. Actually, the period where actually a lot the majority of workers actually had stable employment in this country was a short period after the Second World War. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and up until the 1980s. Before, previous to that, we had you know, some workers were uh, had stable employment in some factories and mills and stuff. But in the main, most working class people actually lived, worked in casual and casual jobs um, and didn't know whether or not they had a job the next day or whatever, all the way through that period. Yeah, um, and, yeah. and, and you, I mean, dockers are a, a, an, ex, an example, um, you know, in Liverpool, basically, my, my grandfather was one of them. He would have to walk down to the docks in the morning um, and hope that he would be picked with the ship that had come in by somebody that he'd get a job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what, what people say is these days, what, what's replaced what we call the cage that people, the dockers used to standing waiting to see if they got a job has been replaced by a text message exactly yeah That's so, right. yeah. so we, i mean we can uh those those things are, are changed similar to the technology things we're, we're still yeah. having yeah. the same battles exactly. uh, today and we should learn from them and i think you're right i mean i, I mean the, the 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 transport strike that happened in liverpool in 1911 yes. Um, yes. is 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 a great example of this where yeah. In, in the North Docks, um, there was hardly any trade union organisation at all. And, and, and organisers had gone in there previously and failed. Yeah, now, there's all kinds of reasons for that. What's his name? Why that happened? But for some reason, there was a catalyst because the seafarers had a strike and they won. And of course, there's big links within between the seafarers and the dockers and families and stuff in Liverpool. And they won. And then that was just became a catalyst. With and within weeks, they'd recruited like thousands of dockers, you know. And how did they do that in these in those days when you know the, most of these dockers were casual? Um, um, it was, there was That's a few directly well, employed. Well, here's the lesson from that. You're dead right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. why why was it possible then? Yeah, I think. I, I, what do you think? I mean, I, I mean, I'm well. I mean, in the it, worst possible it, conditions. Well, I mean, I think that there was society was slightly different. Working class people, the way they worked. I mean, a lot of the, the people who worked would have worked. The, the men, obviously, it was men. I mean, there was thirty thousand people employed on Liverpool docks at the time. Is those those the, the, those men? What's the name? Would have, would would have lived in walking distance of the docks. Yeah, in communities and every and, and all the you know the, the people they work with would, would would live in the same streets as them. So was that there was that community sort of social cohesion, I think, that was there that we don't have today in, in that respect. So we have to organize um what's his name in different ways these days. But but they that the head some of the hurdles that they had to, the barriers that they had to organize, and we don't have today. Yeah. Um, uh, in, 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 in the respect, so we, we've got to look at it and go, Well, hang on, you know, this is what they did. How do we, you know, put that into, into today's, you know, the way our society is organized, the way working class people live today? And that's what we've got to do. And to some extent, we are doing that because we're, we're you know, we're using social media, etc. You know, Facebook. I was on a, uh, a half eight last night with health workers talking to health workers because that's when they finish their shift, you know, talking to them virtually uh, over Zoom about getting involved in unions and stuff. So that's the, that's the sort of thing that we've got to do uh, yeah. and, 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 and learn from that. But but the, the fact that it can be done, but we've seen this in history, you know, these periods of history, the 1880s, the, the great unrest before the First World War, where we've seen these, you know, mass disputes and what's his name, you know, and you were talking about trade union laws, by the way. There was hardly any then, any protection exactly. Exactly. for anybody. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So I think we can we can. Learn I want them. to. I want to um, add. A, I completely agree with you, and I think that's that's why this needs to be studied because, you know, we we we, we inherit the past, but not in exactly the same form always. And um, but I think that what what. The ruling class, particularly the Tories, have done is not only have they tried to shackle our unions, they've also broken up our communities. So what yeah. you're talking, I mean, the East End, where, where I come, it's just 
yeah. you know, demolish it. So you yuppy, yuppy, uh, high rise, not high rise, but high price flats. But I think the key element in, in then and the great unrest and then during the First World War, where the struggle still continued and the shop stewards movement was yeah. really became, became uh, to, uh, to its fore and, and, and so on. The key element is um, <laughs> it's an ideological struggle. I, I think that, that basically what you had in, in that in the period that we're just talking about, the historical period, was the revival of a socialist movement, which was not unified, but amongst those were key elements of people who understood that there were no, there was no room for sweetheart deals. That what basically what it, there was a struggle between capital and labour. When I say it was an ideological struggle, I mean uh, the reason that I called the, the uh, comrade or brother. It's it's only when there was that degree of ideological awareness that women were involved or became involved or were allowed to become involved because people understood what class was. So I'm talking yeah. about people like Tom Mann who played a key role. Eleanor Marx also played a key role, and there are many others. But they and there were there was the the revival of a socialist movement in the 1880s. That's what we need now, not a sectarian movement which just puts your the interest in the sect above everything, but something that is capable of you unifying and seeing the link between all these struggles so that you, you the individual workers aren't picked off they feel part of a movement as they were then the great yeah. unrest affected many many industries many trades and, and you know there was that when i say activism it was an activism with a difference because it understood um basically that this was a movement to change things and and to well attack capitalism basically so I think that's the element that, that we need to bring bring to the fore, as well as everything that you've said. I mean, if there are lessons to be learned from those struggles, when the movement was faced with probably more problems than we've got now, as you say, I mean, there were no union laws. There was no, there was, everything was up for grabs. There was, um, there was no security of employment. And there were all of the things that you've just said. And I didn't own, and, and I think that the point that you've made, made as well is that actually there was hardly any secure input, not just for dockers, but for any, everybody. Yeah. I think that's a really yeah. important point. So how the, how trade unions managed to organise in those circumstances, I think we should think about because they did. I mean, slowly but surely, and that's why I'm talking about peaks and troughs because I think that when the ideological uh, and I'm using that terms in terms of you know ideas being you know that's part of the minds of the, of people, and those ideas were the socialist ideas. And when that became, was eradicated, the, the the movement goes down, you know, because it hasn't got that elan, that that notion that the struggle is for a better world, not just for the immediate issue. I'm not saying that trade unionists are going to leave the road to socialism, but the political dimension that was brought into the struggle, I think, is something that is missing uh, today. And I know that will be extremely uh, uh, treated with extreme hostility between but, but some some um, some trade unionists who, who won't see that point and who, who don't agree, basically. But I I think that is a lesson that we need to learn from history. We have to have those combative ideas that can inspire people to to mobilise and organise and know why they're doing it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 you know, I, I mean, again, I think what's name is. I think one of the other things is that, as you know, from a history, what we need to is put put um, the the things that are happening at that time into context of what other things are happening. Yeah. And I think, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because I just one of the things I was I was going to touch on uh, what I was going to look at was, uh, the, I mean, the, the current issue with, within the NHS over the, the, the so-called the one percent pay award. And there's been a lot of discussion uh, in the press and so-called people who think they're clever saying, you know, about uh, NHS. Or they actually only talk about nurses because they only think nurses work in the NHS, by the way. But, uh, you know, the, um, about going on strike and stuff. So I, 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 I was looking into this and it, and it actually touches on a couple of things that we've already discussed. So first of all, um, I looked at um, 
I tried to find out whether there's any examples of um, nurses going on strike. Um, and the first one I found was in 1918 um, in Bodmin Asylum, yeah, uh, where they went on strike because the management refused to allow them to wear their union badges. Oh, interesting. Another one I found was in 1921, was um, in Brentford. The uh, the nurses were dis some nurses were disciplined for skipping breakfast so they could prepare the hospital for the Easter dance, and they went on strike over that. <laughs> yeah. So this idea of of nurses not going on strike or whatever, any chest workers going, it's not true, you know. And and then I looked at and, and then I looked at. Uh, some of the disputes, probably the biggest dispute that occurred in the NHS was in 1982, which sort of fits in with what you were talking about earlier, because it was, you know, a couple of years after the winter, of so-called winter of discontent and stuff. Um, but it also, what's interesting about the dispute, because again, uh, this is a dispute that when I've read it, and, I, and I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it um, out of history books that are written by white men, um, and the, the dispute is led supposedly by white men but of course the, the, the composition of the actual workforce yeah. is not that yeah, yeah. um and this so it goes back to this hidden from history thing mm -hmm. and it's interesting because um, in the nhs um workers in the nhs really only got uh started to get organized in the 1970s and there was a number of disputes in the 1970s and it's, it was these disputes that actually led to a lot of recruitments of people and certainly Cozy, uh, which obviously was a, a was a union that formed part of Unison, who represented mostly nurses, uh, came out of, um, was actually originally mainly a male union because it came out of psychiatric nurses who worked in mental health asylums. Um, but what we see is in the, in the, in the 1970s, we see a lot more uh, women joining the union and we see a lot more black people joining the union. And the it, in 1982, the people who were on strike are those people. Yeah, it's not the it's not the male white male leaders of the, the union. It's it's these people who are who, and, and are running and are running the dispute. By the way, yeah, yes. and yeah, I, I, I mean I don't know. There might be somewhere uh, a, a, an article somewhere or or a book somewhere that talks about it from their point of view, but I'm, I haven't found one yet. Yeah. <laughs> So, no. <laughs> so, so it's an interest, but it's an interesting dispute, and I think you know if, if we're going to go, if 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 if, if was, as a union, certainly Unison are going to be looking at, uh, and the members of Unison are wanting to take action or do something about this so-called one percent wage rise, then other than uh, which is then we need to look back at those disputes and go, well, what what were the lessons that learned? So when I, when I when I looked at it. One of the things, first of all, a um, lesson we can learn, originally the dispute was um, led by the TUC. It was collab uh, they came together and there was 13 unions involved in it. Uh, unfortunately, what happened, and again, this is another lesson that we learned, is the union split the work, uh, the, the, sorry, the government split the workforce by offering different rates of pay to the nursing staff and to the uh, and so-called ancillary staff, that's what they were called in those days. And that's where the splits occurred then. So that's another lesson we learned that we need to you know, make sure that what's name, that people stick together and we don't fall for those tactics. But what's interesting, one of the things that came out of that dispute, by the way, was, and this, this is according to the Nursing Times, yeah, so I'm not, you know, um, um, they reckon that um, the, the government as a thank you for those nurses that didn't go on strike, um, the government set up the government the pay review body. Apologies, there's a phone ringing in the background. <laughs> well, the wonders of doing things virtually. Um, they actually paid set up the pay review body to thank those nurses that didn't go on strike, and it's the pay review body that are dealing with the one percent today. But yeah. this, is, this is classic divide and rule, isn't it? That's um, yeah. and we sometimes fall for it. I was, it's the um, 40th anniversary of UCS, the Upper Clyde Shipbuilders working. Yep. With, but and one of the, the lessons from that, or, or and again, it, again, because socialist leadership, what they tried to do um, was to um, offer, again, to split the workers by offering a section of them a pay rise, um, 
um, or to, no, sorry, to keep to keep one or other of the yards open. Um, but the demand was no, they could keep it more open. Um, and that's what if they yeah. if they shone down that line, and it's a bit like what you're saying about the nurses, you know, split them, you know, divide them. Yeah. So divide and rule is is a classic. Um, um, uh, well, yeah. a classic, a classic tra strategy, and it, it often works. Uh, my argument is it doesn't work when people can see through it, and that's where you know having a different mindset, i.e., one that doesn't just accept the status quo, challenges. That's when it. And and in the in the seventies, um, that did happen um, quite a bit, really. Um, if you think about Grunwick, although it was defeated. Um, largely because the TUC pulled the plug and and their own union Apex did as well. I mean, you know, the Grum, Grumwick women went on yeah. hunger strike outside the TUC. But one one of the things that kept it going, and it was quite remarkable, was the solidarity action. Because it was the first thing that was banned by by the trade union legislation. But that that fantastic solidarity, you know, so many unions, you know, so that. Like, Again, the cleverness of, of our rulers, they ban solidarity action, they put laws on picketing. Um, and in fact, that la the Labour government of the time was so concerned about this mass action, they themselves, I mean, I've just discovered this just looking through, through records and diaries and so on, that the Labour government with Healy and Callaghan actually were so concerned about the number of strikes strikes unofficial and otherwise that they themselves said we've got to have a code of contact on picketing we got, we've got to stop this solidarity i mean Thatcher didn't invent it all it, it I don't, this is not to disrespect the achievements of the labor government but to look honestly at history and to say well actually what is the biggest threat to the status quo it is organized labor so that's why they have to Betty, i'm gonna yeah. fin i'm gonna i'm gonna finish on that because the time's up is oh, that right. what, you said? Yeah. what you've just said there i think what's his name yeah the biggest threat to the status quo is that is organized labor and i think that's a good really good place to finish okay. so i'd like to thank you for your well, contribution thank today you i've really enjoyed yeah. i've really enjoyed the conversation and i yes, hope everyone yeah. else has thanks very much for listening everybody cheers bye